Okay, Jimmy, welcome to the Freedom Pack podcast. Thank you for having me. I've been uh, eager ever since you reached out to hop on and, and chat with you. So uh, I'm excited about this. I watched a video on your YouTube channel um, called Draw My Life. And oh, that's a good one. <laughs> you, uh, one of the things that stuck out to me is you, you, you mentioned that you had this almost unrealistic desire from a young age to be perfect. Why was that? I would say... And I love that you're getting right into the heavy stuff, Lewis, uh, right from the get-go. So my parents had me when they were 18 years old. And as I learned, as I got older, there was a discussion about whether to give me up for adoption or whether to have an abortion or all the possibilities of having a child when you're very young. And my parents made a sacrifice to keep me. They had their own hopes and dreams that they had to now put to the side so that they could raise me and figure out a way to make it happen. My parents broke up before I was born. So I never really had the traditional, let's say mom and dad in the house. It was a very tumultuous time. And I think my mom's side of the family didn't really care for my dad all that much, given that they knocked up one of their daughters, you know, which makes sense. I would feel the same way as a dad now. And I could feel and sense this pressure to be, I guess, I guess the best way to say it is, the better I was as a kid, the better that I was in school, the better that I was at sport, the better that I was at anything in life, and I was going to achieve something. I was the first in my, uh, my family to go to college. You know, um, the, the more it would make it look like they made the right decision by keeping me, if that makes sense, right? And this didn't really dawn on me until I was about 23, 24 years old. Like, why am I wired this way? And I really went through this process. I started reading a lot of I don't know, like self-realization books, but, but just kind of books that were making me think a little bit outside of myself and, and to reflect a little bit. And I thought that was important for me to kind of understand how I'm wired. I haven't changed, you know, I still have it in me. It's in my DNA, but at least I can recognize why I'm doing certain things and why I'm in, inclined to make a certain decision in a certain way. And that was really important for me kind of in a, in a growth uh, and having a growth mindset, like how can I continue to get better and build off of this? Mm. Sure, it might be a weakness in some ways, but I also think it can be an incredible strength if I understand what I'm dealing with. And so that desire to be perfect is where that came from because I just wanted to be the best person that I could be so that my grandma, maybe on my mom's side, would say, uh, you know what, my dad's okay. You know, he, he, look at the kid that they got together, you know? And so that's really heavy emotionally. And I've kind of worked through it before I would have to tell the story and almost be through tears. Um, but but uh, I've come to grips with kind of the way that I'm wired and, and the impact that that's had on my family. And, and so I went from a guy, you watch the draw my life, who had no business, you know, scaling the heights that I did. But I figured out a way to get to the top and play in a World Cup and represent my country, even though I didn't get recruited out of high school. I had to walk on in college. And I didn't get drafted right away into MLS. We have, you know, weird rules over here, mechanics to get into become a professional. And so I really had to earn everything that I got every step of the way. And I really think that built me to be ready to be a good professional because when you're a good pro or when you're a pro, it's just all ups and downs all the time. And the ones downs are the ones that have the longest careers. And I think that's why I played for 12 years professionally. Yeah. And you mentioned that that probably bled into um, the, the, what you put into football in the end. And I wonder, what was football the outlet for you? And, and if so, would you encourage you know, young children to, to find their outlet if they are maybe suffering from something like imposter syndrome? Of course. Yeah. I think if there's any type of affliction that might be going on with you, I think sports or let's say content creation, which I do now, is a good outlet to express yourself. I think you need balances in your life. And if th something's really heavy in one, I feel like you have to find something that's lighthearted and, and safe somewhere else. And so, I don't know, I feel like I've been an imposter for a long time to kind of you know, play on your imposter syndrome uh, phraseology in, in some ways, because you kind of have to fake it till you make it. You know, there is some kind of mental tricks that you have to play, but yeah, of course. I mean, I feel like I'm living proof that if you just stick with it and if you keep believing in who you are and what you're about, that can lead you to great heights. You might not actually reach, let's say, the World Cup. I never thought I was going to play in a World Cup, you know, but as it got closer, you start to buy into, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm almost as good as those guys, or maybe I am as good as those guys. I just need my chance. And then when I got my chance, 
I did not hand it off to anybody. I grabbed it with two hands and, and made sure that I was going to make the most of it. I think what was really important for me growing up was that I realized pretty early on that it was up to me to decide how good I was going to be at anything. Sports, school, uh, even relationships of all kinds, your friends, you know, the opposite sex, whatever it is. It's all up to me. These are choices that I'm making. Sure, I can blame other people for all these other things. But that is so empowering at a young age. And I was fortunate to run into the dad of a player, Marcelo Balboa, who, and I think I maybe said this in the draw of my life, that, that I just asked him very simply, how did Marcelo Balboa uh, play in two World Cups? And he, he looked at me. And for me, I'd give, like, I'm a talker. I'd give you a 30-minute answer. He looked at me and said, Oh, all he did was go and work on his game every day for two hours. Mm. And I, at that moment, it was such a light bulb, aha moment for me in my life. I was 15. And then I, I, because I knew then it was up to me. Like Marcelo made it up to him. He made the choice to go out there and practice. And I did the same. And it takes a while, right? You go out there in the first five minutes. I think the hardest part when you're starting to train by yourself when no one is watching is you have to accept the fact that you're not as good as you think you are. And if you can get past that and actually get good to where you think you should be and where you are, that changes everything. But that acceptance of, ah, oh, I'm not that good is so important to like building a good base to staying humble throughout that whole process. And so, because uh, there's always room to get better, right? And, and I learned all these little things along the way. So yeah, I, I'm giving you a long answer to this. Kids definitely have to find something that gets them out of their bubble, gets them out of their safe place and really push themselves, but also have a place where they can just be alone and kind of work on developing themselves, whether it's through sport, through art, through media, through school. You know, a lot of people express themselves through school. I'm going to be good at school. And I, and I have a ton of respect and time and appreciation for anybody that's like, I'm going to be good at that. And they give it everything that they have. Mm. I, I love that part in the, um, your story, that Marcelo Balboa uh, story, because it made me think of the, the Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hour rule. Um, and it, it made me reflect on myself as a kid. Obviously, every kid, especially in the UK, wants to grow up to be a professional footballer. And I think that, you know, you, you go to practice, you go to the games, you think that's enough. And you don't really think about the, the, the extra work that goes on behind the scenes of the people that make it to the elite level. So what did, you know, going out for, for two hours a day or, or however long you practice individually, what did that teach you about the pursuit of excellence and what is required to make it to the top in any field? Is it that 10,000 hour rule? I do think there's a lot of truth to that 10,000 hour rule. I mean, if you put 10,000 hours into anything, you better be good at it by the end of 10,000 hours. That's a lot of time. So what I'll say and where I kind of started to tiptoe into it with my last answer was that when I went out to the school and found a wall by my house, I, I didn't know what to do. Like, I didn't know what to work on. I'm like, okay, cool, I'm here, I did it. Like, that's a big first step, first and foremost, is to grab a ball, grab your stuff and say, okay, I'm gonna go work on my game. And then you get out there and you're like, ah, so what am I supposed to work on here? And, and how am I supposed to do it? So really, I just started with, I know my left foot isn't very good. I'm just gonna work on my left foot. So I start kind of juggling with my left foot. Honestly, it was embarrassing. I, I could barely do two, three keepy uppies, you know. It was, it was not matching up with what I expected of myself and what I had visualized I was already good at. Like, I don't need to be a good juggler to be a good player. But that forced me to, to be like, you're not good. And so there was a lot of shame attached to that. And I was embarrassed. Imagine being embarrassed when there's nobody at the park, there's nobody at the school, you're by yourself and you're embarrassed. That is next level embarrassment, right? There's one thing if there's people watching you and you're a little bit like, you're feeling that peer pressure, like I gotta keep this ball up, they're looking at me, but there was nobody there and I was still embarrassed. So I was so ashamed, I went home because it was easier for me, after 10 minutes, by the way, it was easier for me to go home and play video games with my friends than to actually test myself and try to push to get better. Now listen, I'm a big gamer. I love playing video games with my friends. That hasn't gone away, but it just felt just like I wasn't, I don't know. It's really hard to explain other than I just, it just was safer for me there. I felt more comfortable there and I didn't have to acknowledge the fact that I wasn't good at something, right? I think that's the hardest thing. I'm not good at this. And so to my credit, I pushed myself to go back out again. And it was essentially the same thing. 10 minutes and I was like, yeah, I saw, I, I'm not good. 
you know, so you have to deal with that kind of mental process of how good do I want to be at this? And that's when you start to make the decisions. And I'll tell you where the biggest click was. After I did about a week, week and a half, two weeks of 10, 15 minutes, trying to figure out little games that I could do to get better. You know, I ended up putting like a big X on the wall with, a, with some duct tape and just tried to hit the X every single time. Either sometimes I'd let the ball bounce or I wouldn't let it bounce or whatever, whatever you want. It's up to you to design these games. When I went to practice, I was getting a little bit better. And these are against my peers, right? Guys that I see, you know, twice a week. And I felt a lot more comfortable when the ball was coming to me under pressure. So I could see somebody running at me, the ball was coming, and that first touch was starting to get, I was confident in my first touch. I knew what I wanted to do. I knew how to set up my body to make that happen. These are like the hidden byproducts of working on your game when no one's watching. You start to get this comfort level that you can't replicate anywhere else. You can't replicate it for 90-minute trainings, uh, you know, twice a week in a, in a game. You have, to, you have to have that repetition to get to your point about 10,000 hours. And once that happened, and I was starting to get a little bit better, that is the drug that you need to kick on to do the 10,000 hours because then you start to realize, wow, I'm feeling pretty good and I only did 10 minutes a day. Imagine if I did 20 minutes a day, I doubled my output. And then that starts to kick in. And then you start to think, wow. You do, then eventually it became to the point where my mom was like, where is my son? An hour and a half later, I was, at the, I was working on every facet of my game. I was hitting on striking a ball hitting long balls, shooting from distance, dribbling through cones, trying to hit that X on the wall, like all different types of things I could think of to try to make sure I had no weaknesses in my game. But then you start to think, wow, oh, what, if, what if I started running a little bit more? What if I just put 10 minutes into like working on sprints or mm. working on quick feet through a ladder or work, whatever it is? And you just start to and imagine the base that you're setting. So you start here with this base and then you're adding these little, little layers of getting better and better and better and better. And after 10... 10 years of that, because I was 15 at the time, right? 10, 11, 12 years of that. I did 12 years of like continuing to work on my game, trying to get pushed better. All of a sudden I'm playing in a World Cup. Okay, so I went from a kid who was just in a park by himself with no prospects, no scouts looking at me, no coaches that wanted to recruit me, nobody drafting me, nobody wanted me to play for the university. But yet I still found a way of that because my base was so strong of everything that I had built before that. That's why the 10,000 hours is important. Also, during this time when you work out by yourself, it allows you to deal with the, the, the adversity that you're going through, all the failures. Anytime I failed, I saw it as a teaching moment. I saw it as, ah, oh, I got something to work on when I, when I go back by myself. And, and I, didn't, I didn't see it through the lens of, this is the worst thing ever, I'm going to quit, I hate the sport. It was... I got something new to work on that I need to get better at so they can never say I have any weaknesses in my game. And it's such an incredible place, again, to be safe and, and to be yourself and to be able to express yourself both negatively or positively. Sorry, I'm dominating this. I apologize. I talk a lot. Oh, I love it. I love what you said about um, feeling embarrassed and, and pushing through that because I think the best way to chip away at imposter syndrome is to purposely put yourself in uncomfortable uh, positions and when you start to overcome those positions that's how you start getting more confident and that imposter syndrome goes away it's like the, i started this podcast uh, two and a half years ago the first time i interviewed somebody i was awful at it i remember you know i was in i think i interviewed the, the director at nike and i just thought to myself i got no business speaking to the director of nike and so i crumbled and my questions were abysmal and it, it was poor but like i could have quit there but you just keep putting yourself in those awkward positions. And then I like to think now I'm a lot better than I was. And it reminds me of um, a quote I, I, I heard you say, and it was during that, that point when you were practicing in the park, you said, it was almost easier to not try at all than to try my hardest and maybe fail. So do you think that maybe the number one reason that people don't achieve their dreams in life is because they're just scared of failing? Yes. I do. I, I do. And, and, and <laughs> there's a competitive side of me that thinks I'm glad they're that way. Otherwise, I don't know if I would have been able to play in a World Cup. You know, if everybody that had the talent and potential that I saw, the oh, so many talented young players that I played with and against when growing up, that I just never, if those guys had learned and did the things that I was doing, I never would have sniffed the field for the U.S. in a World Cup, you know? So, mm -hmm. so in some ways, I'm thankful that, that that is the way because it allowed me to have success. But on the other hand, yes, I think the fear of failure is so strong in people. And what they, they just, they, the way they're packaging it and where they absorb failure is, is, is just the wrong way. 
I, I love the Nelson Mandela quote who says, I never lose. I either win or I learn. And it is such an empowering quote. It's so powerful because he's right. Yeah, you don't ever really lose. You can lose, right? If you let that be the signature moment of your life. You know, I talk to a lot of people that are over here in the States in particular, like, oh, well, I could have been a professional athlete. I just needed to stick with it. <laughs> no, I'm like, if you, if you were going to be a professional athlete, you would have been a professional athlete. Like, you would have done all the things that were necessary to make that happen. You can't blame your high school coach or an injury. Like, there are thousands of stories of people that overcame those adversities and, and odds and made it happen. So I can't always, you know, if somebody has multiple knee injuries and whatever, I get that one. But like, I just can't always buy into that. And I just think that's just an easy scapegoat. Now I coach a little bit too. And I coach a fourth division team called the San Francisco Glens now here. And all these guys, all these kids want to play professionally. They tell me that. But then I don't see them do the things that I know because I've lived it are necessary to become a pro. And it makes me wonder as to what they're setting up in their own mind to give them an excuse as to why they didn't make it. Are they going to blame me for not starting them? Are they going to blame? They're going to have to have something because people are going to have questions. Oh, why didn't you make it to MLS? Or why didn't you make it to the national team? Or why didn't you make it to Europe? Or whatever it is. And they're going to have some full-blown thing because they have to have it to protect their own egos, you know? So it's really interesting for me as opposed to them just doing the work to become pros. It's like they're trying to position themselves to have like a viable excuse as opposed to just you might fail, dude, but I promise you, if you push and give everything that you have, you're going to learn so much more about yourself. Whether you get there or not, you're still going to get farther along than you would if you're kind of giving yourself and not pushing hard enough. You're going to get farther than you think you will. And you'll also learn and gain respect, not just for yourself, but for, from so many other people who might end up being people that you work with after your career is over, right? So there's all these little things that are tied into it. It's been a fascinating experience, experiment for me and experience to, to – work with these players because I feel like I have such a wealth of knowledge and I can relate to a lot of these guys I can I was the guy that would had to fight for everything and then I ended up getting to the top and I was you know defender of the year and the MLS all-star national team and captain I can relate to that guy too and all the expectations that you have to have when you're in that role so I feel like I can really relate to every player and it's it's been interesting to see kind of the self-sabotage that some people have to to kind of deal with the inevitable failure failure that they think they're going to have as opposed to just I'm going to give it everything I have jump in with both feet and see what happens and that's kind of how I approach life mm. you mentioned adversity and, and your career has been no stranger to adversity along the way um, when you came out of high school there was you know little interest from colleges your your dream college told you you weren't good enough uh, how did you process that what I imagine would be a crushing feeling and ultimately not let it define you good question i would say that i just somewhat categorized it in my mind as they just don't know me they didn't do the work they haven't seen me play they just hadn't heard of me so clearly i wasn't good enough to play for their school so i was going to try to figure out a way to make that happen now i ended up going to a school that wasn't necessarily a rival but played in the same league san diego state i went there my, my youth coach called on my behalf to this college coach who like, yeah, we don't know who he is, but you talk him up. Yeah, I, you know, we'll, give him, we'll give him basically $300 a semester, which covered my books. And I was like, all right, partial scholarship to a division one school, which yeah, gave me a little bit of street cred, but it was barely anything. It was a great way for me to go get experience. And I think had I gone to UCLA, the university that you mentioned, which at that time was producing World Cup players, that had was one of the best programs playing college soccer history. And I grew up watching those games. There was no MLS when I was a kid. So there was no like league to aspire to. Like UCLA was the it. If you wanted to be in soccer in this country, like playing for a top college was really only our, our only outlet. Now, after I got into college, MLS began. And so that, that changed that. But so what ended up happening was, and this is the same thing. I don't know where you're going to go with the next one, but when I didn't get drafted, there's a, there's a lot of parallels here because I went to this other school first, because I didn't get drafted first uh, into MLS and I didn't go to my dream school. I got to play games. I got to play 30, 40 games at the division one level. Had I gone to UCLA right away, I wouldn't have played. We had all Americans in front of us guys. The guy that started when I ended up transferring there, the guy that started ahead of me, my, my junior year, his senior year, he was the number one draft pick in MLS. Like there's so much talent. 
that it was just going to be hard to get any minutes. So how are you going to get better in training? So it ultimately worked out for me. I got 30 to 40 games, ton of experience, and then went over there and proved myself. We ended up winning a national championship, and they can't take that away from me, which I love. So I thought, oh, cool, I won the national championship. I'm going to get drafted in MLS for sure. You know, they're going to want this guy. And uh, it didn't happen. The other four seniors got drafted. I didn't. That was, that was heartbreaking. And there's a lot of elements to that one that just will crush your soul. And I don't know how I fought through that. But because I then didn't get drafted, I went down to a lower division team, second division team, in San Diego again. I don't know why that has a constant theme in my life. I slept on floors. I barely made any money. I was training with the team in the morning, training by myself in the afternoon, training with a tennis ball, uh, running on the beach, you know, like doing anything I possibly can to gain an advantage on these guys. Because as you start to scale, the, it's a real thin margin between talent. And it's basically who's more consistent, you know, who can consistently do the things that you, your team needs uh, to win games. And I, I learned that pretty early on. But again, I got to play 30, 40 games in six months. Had I gone to MLS right away, I would have sat the bench. So all these little growth moments were really important for me. And so I don't know how my career would have been had I got everything that I wanted all at once. You know, and, I, and, and now I'm going to jump ahead because I think this is really important as a, as a thread. When I became the captain of my club team in MLS, I, at that point I was the de reigning MLS Defender of the Year, uh, you know, multi-time or multiple-time All-Star with the national team, playing the World Cup, like everything's going for me at this point. So I bring these young kids get drafted in and they're all excited and they're so frustrated that they're not playing. And I said to them, if I gave you everything all at once, here, you get to be an MLS All-Star. Here, here's a national team call-up. But you did nothing to earn it. Does it mean anything? Does it, is there any value to it whatsoever? There isn't. Sure, you can go tell your friends you got a national team call-up and you got to play at the U.S. And sure, you can say you're the defender of the year or whatever, but you didn't earn it. So what does it matter? Like, it's important to have those steps. You want to, like, the grind should be there. Because then when you get there, it matters to you. There's pride there, and you're never going to let it go. And, and I feel like there's a lot of players, especially our younger players, that want to skip all these steps. They're, everybody wants to know. Everybody asks my dad, oh, how did Jimmy become a pro? And my dad's like, yeah, I don't know. you got to ask Jimmy. That's one. But second, he didn't skip any steps. Like, that's the secret. Everybody wants the secret. The secret is you can't skip any steps. And if you try to, you're going to miss out on an incredibly – valuable opportunity to get better as a, as a person and as a player. Mm. One thing you mentioned that I, I'd love to, to pick you up on, um, when you were at your college and the tryout came up for, for UCLA, you took a massive risk, really. And out of all the high performers I, I've, I've spoken to on this podcast, they all talk about the importance of risk taking. And I think when you, when you went for that tryout, maybe you were risking your starting position at your, your current college and you know, the things that come with our scholarship, et cetera. How did you weigh up at the time that risk reward factor? Because yeah, it, you know, it worked out for the best, but it, it might not. Have. When the opportunity came and this was a bit of a struggle, I'll kind of save us a lot of steps. But when I finally convinced the coach to give me a chance at UCLA, I didn't, and the decision came whether I wanted to take it or not. Hmm. I knew that I'd always regret not taking that chance that, 10 years from then, I'd be like, oh, I should, I should have done that UCLA thing. And I, when I thought about it, the opposite, where I don't think in, t in 10 years' time, I would have looked back and said, man, I'm so glad I stayed at San Diego State. I'm so glad I didn't go chase my dream at my dream school. You know, I, it was a, a bit of a no-brainer. So, yeah, I took a big risk. I left a scholarship, which had been much higher at that point because they added money to my, to my scholarship after my sophomore year. I, I definitely left a guaranteed starting spot, maybe even as the captain of the team. The coach told me after I decided to leave that I would never amount to anything. Like, yeah, you go to UCLA and that's great, but, but you're never going to play, right? So I'm now walking out, letting him down and him really demeaning me, even though he takes full credit for my success, by the way, now. So fun <laughs> fact for you. Twist of irony there. And what happened was when I went to UCLA, it wasn't like I was already on the team. I, I, just, went on a, I just went to go try out. It wasn't even – oh, yeah, we'll bring you over from another Division I school and you're on the team. It was, we kind of don't even really know who you are. You play at a school that we, we stomp three or four nothing every time we play. Uh, but we liked your size. You seem like a nice guy. Uh, you know, we'll give you one week to try out. We give other people two days to try out. And I said, I'll take it. And really how I rationalized 
that risk and how I maybe minimized some of it in my mind and to take the enormity of the pressure and expectations. Okay, because over here we can take a redshirt year, right, where you don't play because sometimes you get hurt or whatever it is. So you can actually play for five years, though. One of the years you don't play, it's called the redshirt year. I thought, okay, if I don't make the team, I'll call it my red shirt year. Nobody else will call it that, but I'll call it my red shirt year. And I'll still have two years of eligibility and, and I can kick on from there. So that was kind of my safety net. I got into my dream school. If I don't get picked right away, I've got a year to work on my game so they cannot deny me. I'll try to join them in the spring or whatever it is. And I knew that I would make it at some point, whether it was the first year or, or, or the second year. So that was kind of how I jumped in. And that's how I kind of got my family to buy in too. Cause they're like, what are you doing? UCLA costs two or three times as much money and we don't have a lot of money. We are a paycheck to paycheck family. Um, and I had to buy used boots when I was a kid because we couldn't afford it. So it was a big, big leap of faith. And I had to give them some justification as to why I wanted to do this. Thankfully they had my back and we figured it out. Uh, scary, scary times on a lot of different levels, right? Both off the field and on. So I get one week. Now, what was interesting about this and one part of this that I actually didn't bring into my draw my life because and not that I skipped past it, but it just would have been a, an extra step of, of this. But my high school teammate, who was younger than me, got recruited to UCLA. He was coming in as a freshman. I, I was going to be a junior. So I was two years older than him. And he's like, hey, we're having our, you know, I wasn't, I was just a tryout guy. But he's like, hey, we're having our, like, uh, physical test. So all the, all the players that are coming back, they have to come in early. The doctors check them, make sure, you know, they're getting their physicals. Uh, yeah, it happens everywhere. He's like, you should come. I was like, okay, cool. You know, I get to meet some of the guys. Hope, I don't know, maybe I'll get a physical. I don't know. You know, I'm just kind of being hopeful and being positive. So we go to the school and I go to the door with, with him and they say, oh, you're trying out. You can't, you can't come in here. And, you know, the door opens and it's like all the guys on the team and guys I looked up to because I've seen them play before and I've seen them on TV and they're all laughing and have a good time. It's preseason. Everybody's in a good mood. Everybody's happy to see each other after a long summer or whatever. And I got told I can't come in. So I had to go sit in a room by myself for three and a half hours with no phone. This is before phones. And because my friend drove, I couldn't leave. I, you know, obviously. But I'm, cr dude, I am crestfallen. I, I'm like, what am I doing here? I feel, I, feel, I feel stupid. Like all the players saw me come in. And that got told to leave. Now, I, I'm, now I'm identified as kind of the guy that's not good enough already, you know? And honestly, I mean, just thinking about it, it, it's, it's, it makes me almost tear up because I was so heartbroken that that's how I got treated by the assistant coach who I'm now really, really good friends with. But that was his initial thing with me. Like, nah, man, you're not on the team yet. And, and that just, like, there's two ways you could take that. One, I'm going to quit because this isn't what I thought it was going to be and this isn't going to be easy. Or two, I'm going to prove that mother effer wrong. And I'm going to make sure that, that, that I'm going to earn him to always open the door for me. Okay? And I, took, I chose the latter. And so let's fast forward to the, 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 the banquet. We win the national championship. I've been with the, the team for two years. I make the team after a week, by the way. I'm in and out of the lineup. But I end up starting that championship run. Uh, you know, the guy in front, I wasn't even starting that first playoff game. Guy tears his knee that's in front of me five minutes in. I play the rest and we end up winning it. Coincidence? I don't know, Lewis. I think, I think I helped. I think I helped. But we go to the banquet. So we're talking a month later. We've already won it. We have a big banquet. Our families are there. And our head coach, Ziggy Schmidt, rest in peace, who unfortunately passed away a year and a half ago, he, he you know, takes a moment to talk about each senior because we'll be leaving the school. He ends up saving me for last. And he ends up saying that if he could pick any player that he's ever coached, and now this is his third national championship. He's been coaching there for 15 years. If he could pick any player that really epitomizes what it means to be a UCLA soccer player, that always has a good attitude, that always brings it no matter what, even if things aren't going his way, <clears throat> I'm going to get emotional here. <clears throat> he, said, he said me. And I was like, it's he – is he talking about this guy right here? I just couldn't believe it. He had never shown me much affection because I wasn't one of his guys. He didn't handpick me. He didn't go recruit me. He didn't scout me. I came to him. So for him to say that uh, was unbelievable. And it, like my family was blown away. And I got up there to speak because every senior spoke afterwards. And I didn't know what to say. I was so overwhelmed with 
that. And to, to think where I started, where I was told I wasn't good enough and I had to wait in a room by myself for three and a half hours to then being told that I epitomize what it meant to be a UCLA soccer player is just, dude, I mean, I, I've, had, I've achieved a lot of things in my life, but that one probably means the most, if not one of the most uh, in, in my whole career. Yeah, that's beautiful, man. I wonder if you, you, you took the same with you when, you know, you mentioned that there was that crushing moment where, you know, you had to sit by and watch four of your peers get drafted to the MLS. And I think there's probably two ways you could play that. You could either, you know, blame everyone else apart from yourself and you could start saying, this is the reason why, that's the reason why, or, and, you know, maybe this isn't for me. The cards ain't going to fall in my favor. Or you can say, you know, I'll stand up, I'll do it my own way. What was that process like and, and was that the approach you had? A hundred percent. I can give you another example, which will kind of demonstrate this. But I want to start with kind of the ending first. Yeah. I think what helped propel me throughout my career was that I didn't want, and I didn't think it was fair for anybody else to tell me what I could and couldn't be good at, right? Which is something I mentioned before. But who has the right to tell me I, that I'm not good enough, right? I, I, that, that's up to me to decide when I quit. I, I didn't feel like it was, it, it shouldn't be on anybody else to say, hey man, I mean, imagine telling that to somebody. It, it, you're, you're just not good enough or you should quit or maybe not good enough, but you should quit. I think there is constructive criticism where I would go seek out a coach. You said, hey, you're not good enough at this or whatever. So there are some discrepancies there, some gray area. But I just couldn't accept the fact that I was going to let somebody else determine how far I was going to go in the game. And so I think that's really where the genesis of my, like, yes, I do want to mention too, that for everybody that might be dealing with adversity, you have to allow yourself to go through the process this, uh, of sadness and frustration and all that. I went through that. I, I went to my mom crying. I, I went to my friends and like, you know, you need somebody that's going to lift you up and give you a hug, you know? So I, I, I had those outlets, but at some point, as you said before, you have to stand up and, and like, I'm going to do this and nobody's going to get in my way. And if they do, I don't have time for that person. I'm going to keep going. I have the singular focus. I want to see how far I can go in this game. And it's up to me, right? Again, it's, these are choices that I'm making. So I had the choice to, to feel sorry for myself, which I gave myself some time to do. And I think, again, to deny that feels like it wouldn't be human. Like you're an absolute robot if you don't allow yourself to emote and feel sad for yourself, right? But you can't let that overwhelm and overtake everything else that, that you want to achieve because that'll weigh you down. That is a big anchor. So at some point, you, yes, you give yourself that time to do that, and then you got to get on with it and pick yourself up and go, I got this. I'm going to figure it out. I don't know how yet, but I've got some smart people and people I love and trust that are going to help me get there, and then I'm going to go show everybody that I can. So let's get now to the draft. I thought I'd get drafted for sure. Top college team. At this point, there's no academy systems or any real – sophisticated academy systems that MLS clubs have doesn't exist. So college was like the best place for these MLS teams to go. The other four seniors did, and I'll say this to my coach, he recruited the other four seniors. And I'm sure he made promises to those parents that once the pro league starts, you know, I'm going to get your son drafted. You know, this is my promise to you. He didn't make those promises to my parents because he didn't recruit me. So, excuse me. He, he, I just was kind of a, you know, second, I've always was kind of second string to him in, in, in some different ways. So after the draft happens and I don't hear anything, I don't have an agent or anything, you know, I go into his office. I'm like, yeah, so I, I'd, like to, I'd like to give it a shot, you know, but I don't know, really know what to do. And so I think at that point he felt kind of guilty. Like I'm now addressing him as a human. Like it's one thing if I'm on a piece of paper and whatever, and he can push those other guys. But now, like, human to human, he's like, all right, let me see what I can do. So he calls the L.A. Galaxy because we're in L.A. He's like, hey, you know, we got Jimmy here. Uh, can he come train with you guys? We get it all sorted out. I got to start training with the Galaxy. So at this point, I go to the Galaxy training, and I'm buzzing, man. Like, these are the guys that I, I used to – so the, they used to play at the Rose Bowl, a famous stadium in, in, in the U.S. That's where the 94 World Cup final was between Italy and Brazil, right, where Baggio hits, hits it over or hits the post or whatever, and uh, Brazil ended up winning. I used to live 15 minutes from there and I didn't go to any games because again, we couldn't afford it. So it was like, it kind of sucked. I really wanted to see and smell what, what that tasted like to be inside the stadium. But 
that was such a magical place for me. When I grew up, all my little youth games were outside. They're like these big giant, like basically parking lot areas where they play these games. So this was like a big thing. So for me to go to the Galaxy who were playing in the Rose Bowl that I now had gone and seen them play and all these guys that I looked up to was amazing. So I'm at, I'm at, I don't say a word. I, you can tell I'm, I got a pretty good personality and I'm not saying a goddamn word. I'm not saying anything. I don't want anybody to think like I'm trying to be bigger than I am. I'm just there to play and prove myself on the field. So I, I, there's a couple of layers here, but I'm going to start with, we're at training one day and I'm with this guy named Danny Pena. This guy is as tough as I've ever seen a player. He is like a Roy Keane CDM. He doesn't have time for anybody. He'll tear your head off no matter what the situation is. He smokes cigarettes during halftime of games. Like the guy is like, you know, this is like throwback to the throwback guys, right? And I was like, this guy, I kind of like this guy, but he's kind of scary too, right? So we get thrown into this running group, right? It's still preseason for, for the Galaxy, and, and they're not like in full preseason, but it's still a time to like start working on your fitness. I'm in his group, and I knew pretty early on that if you, if you are the fittest guy in, on your team, you rarely, you rarely get cut. I mean, you have to really suck at playing if, if, if you're the fittest guy on the team uh, and you get cut. And I think that always showed the coach that you cared, that you were trying to put that extra work in and you were doing everything possible to get the most out of yourself and to push the players around you. So I took a great deal of pride in that. And it helped me achieve things, right? It helped me achieve stuff at the youth level. It helped me achieve stuff at San Diego State and UCLA. And I, I just, I, I, I trusted in it, okay? Now, when... I got into a running drill, Danny Pena, this guy, Mr. Roy Keane, smoking cigarettes, he's leading it. And he's like, hey, nobody runs faster than me, okay? You know, and I was like, all right, well, maybe this guy's a horse, you know? Maybe he gets after it and likes to push. Dude, the guy was like the slowest jog I've ever seen. And they put a lot of young guys, other guys like me, that were kind of trying out, and some of the younger players on the team. And none of the other veterans were with him because they know how he is. And they don't want to be in his group because he's kind of lazy when it comes to this stuff. So I run like the first lap with him. It's kind of like interval training, like 40 seconds on, 20 seconds off. We're doing that for 20 minutes or whatever. It could be hard if you made it hard. And it could be a challenge. This dude, as I said, jogs. And nobody has the balls to run past him. And after a lap, I was like, I'm trying to make this team. Like, it doesn't, this doesn't help me. So I just went. You talk about taking risks. I, I just went. And so I just started doing it as hard as I could. And he, I, I could see smoke coming out of this dude's ears. He was so upset because now he had to push a little bit because now he's being shown up by this tryout kid who's got, you know, bright eyed and bushy tailed and going to figure out and solve the world's problems, you know, that, that, uh, that, with, with that innocence that you have when you're a kid. So we're done running and he comes up to me. And I thought he was going to beat me up. And he gets like really close to my face. And he says, you know, what the F are you doing? And, and I look at him and I say, and I almost start to cry. Like I am like there. He can tell that I'm about to cry. I said, man, you're on the team. I'm not. Like, wh what do you expect out of me? What am, I, what am I supposed to do? You know, and at that I didn't know what else to say. I, I didn't know how to defend myself other than that, just to be as raw and pure and, and transparent as possible, not trying to be his buddy or anything. I just didn't know what else to say. And from that day forward, he never bothered me again and always supported me. He backed off completely. He understood where I was coming from. And uh, yeah, that was crazy. That I, again, another like one-on-one -on -one type risk in that one. Like nobody else is looking at it. It's just me and him. And I thought he was going to beat me up. And uh he ended up becoming one of my biggest supporters. And I think he's really proud of what I achieved. And I think a lot of it goes back to that type of mentality that I had. So think about that. I've gone and I've, I've really impressed a lot of the older guys, the coaching staff. I'm there for, for 10 days. And I, I do so well in those 10 days, Lewis. They're like, hey, we're going to take you to Florida for our, our official preseason. We really want to let you go. And everybody was so excited for me. I was number 29 of 29 guys, right? They got me my little bag. I had all the Galaxy polos. Now, this is before phones, by the way, okay? Also, I should add this in. One of my teammates from UCLA, Matt Reese, goalkeeper, was, did get drafted by the Galaxy. So he's there. We're still living on campus. So he, he, um, we're still going to go back to UCLA where we are. He's now found out that I got named, right? But I'm sticking around to get all my gear or whatever. He takes off. He, we drove separately. He goes back. He ends up going back and telling everybody that I made the team, that I'm going to the thing. And, you know, everybody's excited for me. 
and there's no phones, by the way. So just, just to remind everybody. So I get all this stuff. I'm getting high fives from all the older guys. They're so excited for me. I'm feeling like, oh my God, I did it. I can't wait to tell like my family and friends. And as I'm walking out, the coach opens his door. They, they let him know that I'm about to leave. He's like, hey, come in here for a second. So I go in there and I'm like, obviously super nervous, but also super excited. I sit down. He goes, hey, you know, I don't know if we can take you anymore, actually. We, we have to figure out uh, the budget stuff. And, uh, you know, we'll call you later tonight. We'll call you like 6 p.m. I said, okay, you know, trying to keep a good spirit and good attitude. Yeah, sure, this stuff happens, you know, and whatever you're going through in your mind to, like, not fall apart completely. Okay, cool, cool, no problem. Yeah, I look forward to getting your call, and I'm I'm excited. Thank you again for considering me for this, blah, blah, blah. So I get out of there. It's 1 o'clock, and now I start to sweat because I then don't tell any of my family and friends, right, because there's nothing to tell them yet because it hasn't been official. But now I'm going back to UCLA where we stay where Matt Reese, my goalkeeper teammate, has told everybody that I'm going. So I walk back in and I'm like, oh yeah, you know, kind of giving like those half high fives and fist bumps. Like, yeah, 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 I'm totally going. It's going to be, oh, I can't wait. It's really exciting to be there with Matt. It's going to be amazing. And kind of said all the right things. Six o'clock comes. I'm like, I'm waiting at the phone, by the way. Six o'clock comes, no call. So what do you do? Do I, do I call these guys? Do I just assume I'm going to go? What do I do? I end up calling at seven and saying, hey, what's, just wanted to check in. I know you're busy. Just, you know, what was the story? Trying to be super nice and kind, of course. And he goes, oh, yeah, sorry, man, you can't go. We'll see you in two weeks and hangs up. And now I've got to face the music. Everybody, I mean, we're talking all the sports teams because we were friends with everybody, right? The volleyball team. Well, everybody was so excited for me because I was the one guy that didn't get drafted and everybody was kind of pulling for me to get picked, you know, to do something. And now I had to face the music of all these people. Like, actually, I, I'm not going. And, and imagine that, that, that feeling of, I'm not good enough again. You know, I, they don't think I'm good enough again. It's heartbreaking, dude. It's absolutely soul crushing. And so, you know, you go into a dark hole for a day and you kind of have to keep ans- an- answering the same questions over and over. And then I ended up running into a former UCLA guy, Ante, Ante Razov, who got cut from the Chicago fire. He was kind of going through a similar experience. And so we kind of latched on there. We just trained every day together. And he ended up being one of the, he scored over a hundred goals in MLS eventually, you know? So, mm. A crazy story, but then, you know, you fight through it. I come back, I end up going down to the smaller team. I dominate, do pretty well, get called up by San Jose, play there for four years, win an MLS Cup, go to Kansas City, and I just take off from there. I win an Open Cup, and then individually, Defender of the Year, six-time All-Star, National Team, World Cup, played against some of the best players in the world, held my own in a World Cup. I, it's insane. I was in video games and a cereal box, and all because I was willing to, to, to pick myself up when things didn't go well. And just to, to keep pushing and believing in myself throughout the process. It's a beautiful, beautiful story, man. I know we're, we're, we're short on your time. I wonder if we have time for one more question. Before yeah, go, go for it. Let's do it. Let's do it. So what fascinates me about um, uh, like a sport like football is, you know, you, you spend all this time trying to become a footballer. You become a footballer and you, you know, you're involved in this, this world that's almost like a bubble. And, you know, it, it probably absorbs your entire identity almost, I imagine, like for as long as you play football, that's who you are. You are a footballer. Your identity is tied into that. I wonder um, what fascinates me is when it is time to, to call a day on the career, did you suffer with any identity issues when you left? And if so, how did you deal with that and transition back into, well, the normal world? <laughs> yeah. I don't know if people, if they know what I do now, consider what I do the normal world because I've been pretty fortunate to fall into some fun media stuff. But when I retired, I got forced to retire. I retired due to concussions. Uh, I had a couple of bad ones. And it got to the point where I had a headache for three months. My second daughter was on the way. Just I was 34. I wasn't going to get called into the national team anymore. I was just kind of like hanging on to hang on. And uh, it just felt like a nice time and a smart time to s- step away from the game. But once that decision was made and made it official, I went to call my wife just to kind of give you guys. I went to the parking lot. And I couldn't get the words out that it was over. I, I was just, oh, man, just, just total crying, like heaves, you know, those physical heaves of crying. She thought somebody had, had meaningful had died in my life, like something. And I, I, but when you look at it, something had died. My identity had died. Everybody had associated. I was the, the professional athlete. You know, uh, I, that's my role within my family, my friend group. I'd been that for so long that what was I going to be now? And it took me 
despite having good opportunities, I went into the TV route, just like, you know, you see these other guys, Micah Richards, Jamie Carragher, all these guys. And it's just because that's an easy place to fall into and just put on a suit and kind of keep talking about the game. But is that what I was passionate about? You have to work through all that. And it took me about nine months. I'll be honest. I was depressed. It's a lot easier for me to say now, but I was depressed for about nine months. The only time where it's, and, and, and I was around the game still. So you kind of smell the grass and, and you miss being a part of a team and the banter in the locker room and all that little stuff that, that you, you take for granted for sure. And what really changed for me was that I had transitioned to New York City at this point, was building a YouTube channel called Kick TV. And they had us in the studio a lot. And we finally talked them into letting us go outside. So we went to the Euros in 2012. And that is what it unlocked it for me a little bit. I got to be like a proper fan of the game. For the first time in my life, I didn't have to worry about preparing for a big match. I could just sit there and, and enjoy it and watch it. Not only that, I got to go get drunk with fans and they paid me for it. I was like, okay, hold on, time out. I can, I can get into this. This is not bad, you know? And I got to go to World Cup finals and Champions League finals and Super Classico between Boca Juniors and River Plate. And I saw the Milan Derby and the Manchester Derby. I just, all these incredible experiences, you know? And, and, but it was that first one in Poland and Ukraine in 2012 that really kind of shook me out of the depression and funk that I was in. And that, hey, this is, you've got, you're very fortunate to have this opportunity. Now's the time. Let's jump in with both feet and give it everything that we have and see where we end up. But it took me a little bit to get there because I still was so wrapped up in my identity as a player. And what's crazy now, Lewis, is that when people see me, a lot of people just know me as a YouTube personality or social media personality. They have no idea about this hardcore playing career that I had where I had to fight and scrap for everything that I have. So that, that Draw My Life video is, is really important to give people some reference who might not know anything about my playing career and where and how I had to fight to get to where I got. And then really what's great about the professional athlete career, or no matter what, like even if you fall out of the sport or maybe you have a significant injury, and you're at 19, like the habits and disciplines you learn to get to wherever you got, you can definitely trans transfer those over to what you're doing now. And, and so I see that. My work rate in this space is, is just as good as anybody at the very top. Like I put the time in, I do the research, I like to be very thoughtful about what I say and why I say it. And all, it's like me hitting up a ball against the wall, right? I still am doing that, but I'm just doing it in a different way. So listen, I, I'll, I'll leave this by saying, and if you have any follow-ups, I, I encourage them, but it really is up to you to decide how good you're going to be at everything. And it's not going to be A to B. It's never going to go a straight line. It just never happens. You're going to have to fight for some things that you want to have, and you're going to have to make some sacrifices in some other areas that you might not want to make to get there, right? You have to have a little bit of that singular focus to be great. So I, I, I just can't, I believe in every single person. I see different people and they bring different things to the table. And if they really wanted it, I know they could achieve it. It's just up to, it's up to them, but they have to want it. You can't want it for them, you know? So there's a, there's a lot of layers there, but I'm living proof that the impossible is possible. And hopefully I can inspire a few people along the way. Amazing, man. Such an amazing time talking to you. Such a, an amazing career. I, I encourage everyone who's watched this to go onto YouTube and type in Jimmy Conrad goal against Mexico. I, I love that goal, man. <laughs> Great head and just to see the euphoria on your face and what it means, I think that's a beautiful moment. I encourage everyone to go check that out. Um, yeah, man, thanks for, for telling your story today and pouring so much value into the conversation. You know, you can take what we learned today and take that from football and apply it to almost any field. So thank you so much for bringing the value. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed the conversation, man. Yeah, thank you, Lewis. Thank you for having me. It's much appreciated.